Okay. So um, this is Gabriel Cram from the Restorative Practices Alliance. I am here in this moment representing the uh, Global Resilience Summit. I have the good fortune to be in conversation with our friend and advisor, Alarian Merkuliev, who is the convener of the Wisdom Weavers of the World, whose film we've just watched. Um, he's also the president of the Global Center for Indigenous Leadership and Lifeways. And uh, it's very nice to see you. Thanks for being with us today. I'm Juan. Uh, I said, uh, which means hello, my other self. This is the way that my people, the Unungan people, the Bering Sea, greet each other every day. And uh, uh, I said that. Um, the morning tastes good. This is another way we greet each other every day. Kalam Echem Nat Kalam Kasuda. And uh, I said my traditional name is Kuyach, which means like an arm extending out from the body, a uh, carrier of ancient knowledge into modern times, a messenger. And I am from the people of the sea line, not the California sea line, but uh, the stellar sea line. Wow. Uh, so and we've been out in the Bering Sea for over 10,000 years and we're still there. So there's so many things that are remarkable in what you just said uh, that I'm, I'm very excited. So the first thing I think, when you say the Bering Sea, it's so far off the coast of Alaska. I was looking at a map. It's the it's St. Paul Island. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles. It's probably equidistant between Asia and Alaska. Is, is, is it not? Very mm -hmm. far. Off the coast. Yeah, it's very close. Okay. Um, so, and your people have been there for 10,000 years. Over 10,000. Over 10,000 years. We have stories of, that go back to originating out of Egypt, coming to out of Mongolia, to Kamchatka, to uh, Siberia, and then to Kamchatka, and across by boat, not by the Bering Land Bridge. Wow. Um, I think it's an extraordinary lineage, and, you know, I think... Uh, I'm carrying, so we've been working within the context of this conference for several days, and so I'm carrying the awareness of several streams of thought and conversation that we've been holding in the conference, and one of them is around ancestral awareness, and I think, you know, uh, speaking as a white person of Jewish origin here in the United States, um, to hear that you know 10,000 years of your lineage, um, it's extraordinary, it's humbling, and I um, I imagine, I wonder, you know, what that's like, because I think many of us don't know our lineage in that, that profound a way. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it would be characterized in the modern day as magical. I mean, you know, I got my traditional name at four years old by the last queer that was left alive amongst my people. And he gave me his name, and so we call each other Kuya. And uh, uh, I grew up on St. Paul Island, as you mentioned, was a power place, a power center. Uh, it was known to have the most lightning strikes in any place in North America in the 1800s. Uh, and we, we grew up with magical things, including things like uh, portals. Um, which I, I, I don't want to get into because of that gets into another whole story. But uh, uh, it's, it's a place that had um, 1.2 million northern fur seal, 2.5 million seabirds, 1,000 reindeer, and 450 Unungan people. So it was a very magical place to grow up as a child. Wow. Remarkable. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, I was, the island is only 12 miles long and five miles wide. I was going to ask, so a million fur seals, 1.2 million fur seals in an island of 12 by five miles. Yep. So you were surrounded by wild creatures. Yep, and they were all concentrated on the shoreline. Uh, on the edge of the island. So it was heavy concentration of wildlife. I've heard you say, and you said, you know, a moment ago that this was a traditional name, Kuyux, that was given to you by the last surviving Kuyux in your tribe. It was, it was handed to you. you. You were recognized. You received the, the name. And I've, oh, please, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. 
Well, and I've heard you speak about being mentored from a very young age in a traditional manner. And I've heard you also say that in that mentoring, your mentor probably, I think you said, spoke less than 200 words to you prior to the age of 12, that most mm -hmm. of the teaching was nonverbal. That's right. At age five, I had what, what we call an acha. An acha relationship is, uh, well, it's not like anything that you have ever encountered, I guess, because uh, when, we, when a young child sees an older person, they know instantly that that's my acha. And so we call each other acha. And that unspoken way is very important through that mentorship because he took me under his wing from age five to age 13 and taught me much of what I know about reverence for the animals and wildlife, uh, sharing, caring, cooperation, the ethics and values of a good hunter, all these kinds of things. And uh, from that time, from age five to age 13, he literally said no more than 200 words to me. Uh, it was more by action and behavior that he taught me. And the adult's job in that tradition is to create the space for a child to learn, not tell him what to learn, how to learn, or define anything. So I grew up not asking a single question. And my job was to watch, listen, and learn. I've heard you um, speak and write about some of the experiences that you had in that upbringing. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I heard you speak about this or, or you, you wrote about an experience um, of being with hunters and, and seal hunting. And um, part of what stood out to me so deeply, and I think part of what I wanna say contextualizing this observation for a Western audience, you know, for uh, an English speaking audience and a European educated audience, many of whom, many of us were really trained to sort of organize our awareness in cognition. You know, if we look at European intellectual history, we see this moment with Descartes where he says, I think, therefore I am, and this real prioritization of kind of conceptual discursive thought. And one of the things that we've talked about and that is a real deep hallmark of indigenous awareness is the this awareness that so many of our ways of knowing are not cognitive, right? And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, I've heard you speak about experiences you had growing up where you were out hunting, for example, with elders, and there was an unspoken awareness that was permeating. And, you know, like all of a sudden, everyone was looking in a certain direction and then come the, the seals. I wonder if you would speak a little bit about these nonverbal ways of knowing and how you um, were sort of, nurtured into those awarenesses you you've you've got a good memory <laughs> uh yeah i wrote about that in, in my book wisdom keeper a one man uh journey to honor the untold story of the united people and this uh yeah we the intelligence uh, of the human being we call ourselves real human beings and uh, people who live this way understand what that means all over the world. Uh, that uh, we, uh, we know that the intelligence is the entire human body uh, and is guided by the heart. And uh, the Yupik elders in Southwest Alaska call this the reverse society or the inside out society because we reversed all the laws for living. And one of the most salient ones is that now the mind tells the heart what to do. When traditionally the heart would, would tell the mind what to do and the mind's job is to implement what your heart is telling you to do. And uh, now today, because the mind is telling the heart what to do, we're all filled with the uh, traumas and human attachments that prevent us from going to the heart. And uh, this is why things are going awry in the world today. Uh, and you, you talk about social injustices, of political corruption, wars, uh, refugees, uh, the violation of women. These are all due to one source, which is detachment from one's heart. Uh, and that, if, uh, that there used to be a time when the entire world used to be that way of living in the heart. And then we slipped out of the heart, and as soon as we did, we created time. 
because we left the proverbial infinite now. And we left it because we're, we're filled with guilt, shame, remorse, anger, rage, jealousy, all these kinds of things from the past or fear, which is projection to the future. Every place except for now. That's when time began. Wow. <laughs> okay, so this is very rich conversation. Um, I think, you know, it's very interesting. Your part of your name means a hand reaching out to the world. And I've heard you say you're, you're translating ancient knowledge into the modern world. And I think our roles are certain in certain ways similar. One of the most fun experiences I've had in the last several weeks was having you and Dr. Stephen Porges on a call together. Um, Dr. Porges is a friend and mentor of ours who developed the polyvagal theory. And he speaks in the language of neurophysiology. And he's also a very humble person. And he said something to me that I thought was very beautiful because uh, he said to me, I didn't discover the polyvagal theory. He said, the polyvagal theory existed. I just translated it into neurophysiology, which is a great thing to say, right? So one way of complementing your words through a neurophysiological lens is to say that when we feel safe enough to be in our hearts and connect with people, then literally the heart at an autonomic physiology level is running the brain. We can see that in a, in a scan. We can look at heart rate variability. We can look at you know, the, the brain waves and know that that's happening and that the vagal nerve, the vagus, the vagal system, which is primarily sending information from the body up to the brain is actually doing that job with the heart when we feel safe and connected, telling the brain what to do. And then when we get scared and we get defensive, it switches and the brain tries to tell the heart what to do, only it's just not good at that. And the system just goes haywire. And then people act out of fear and they do all of these things that cause chaos that you were talking about. Um, I think it's just so fascinating and beautiful, the, the consilience between the most cutting edge neurophysiology and this ancient awareness. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the science is now coming full circle and are going to hit the indigenous ways very much. Finally, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah, really. Uh, but you know, it's uh, uh, when the mind tells the heart what to do, uh, it, it things go awry, as you say. And the thing is, ma the majority of the world, but particularly the Western world, is in that mindset. And the elders that I work with, the wisdom weavers of the world, they say that uh, we've got to change our consciousness from the, from the mind to the heart. But it's going to take great courage, as you know, because uh, you've got to get rid of all the clutter in the mind and all the trauma and all the things that need healing. And there isn't a human being in the world now that hasn't some kind of trauma, either passed down from generation to generation and or existing in your own life and um, and so the thing that people do is they're they don't want to touch it and so they stay away from it and they they're safe when they're in their mind they think they're safe in their mind but to get to it you have to go through and re-experience and process all these things that clutter your mind before you can get to the heart and that's no easy job it's very, very important and interesting what you're saying. And I think partly because one of the contexts where this um, will be shown is a mindfulness oriented conference. Uh, you know, part of, part of what comes to me is that mindfulness, the practice of being in the present moment, because you were earlier speaking about how when we move into the head, we move out of the present moment. We move into the cognition, into thinking we're either in the past or the future, but we're not in the infinite now. To move back into the infinite now, part of the doorway is this awareness of the present moment, mindfulness. And then this complementary awareness that you're saying, which is really around trauma resolution, that we have to process through, work through that content to get to our hearts. Right? And I think this is something that's really important and maybe not so often understood because for so many folks, there are so many things that they don't want to feel painful experiences, both personal and intergenerational. And it's, it's frightening to people to be in contact with those. And so they escape. I mean, I know I, I can't say for anybody else, but that was my experience as a young person. When I dealt with overwhelming trauma, I went into my head because then I didn't feel it, but at tremendous cost. And my journey has been about coming back 
um, in, into the heart, I think. Um, and, I, and I will just share, you know, with you, I don't know that we've talked about this. The first, I think, really authentic experience I had of that was in an indigenous context. It was in a, a teepee ceremony in the Native American church. And it was, uh, I was so deeply moved by the beauty of the sincerity of someone who spoke. You know, I was thinking about um, this recently because I was a college student, a college dropout at the time, and I went to this, and I remember that the way that we, we thought it was so cool to be sarcastic in our speech. And I went to this ceremony and there was a moment where a young man stood up to speak and to pray and I was astonished by his sincerity. It, I began to weep because I realized that I had not heard someone speaking that sincerely for maybe 10 years, maybe my whole life. And I, and I realized in that moment how disconnected I was from my own sincerity, you know? And that was a transformative, you know, moment for me. Yep, and you know, it, it takes real courage to do that. And, you know, that's fine to be fearful, but if you, ha if you decide to move through it, it takes real courage to do that. Um, and, it, it, and that's very few people understand uh, from what I've been around the world talking with people, they, they don't want to go to that place that you talk about. And, uh, but the only way to get to the heart is to do that, to process it, to feel it, and to let it go. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's something that uh, we have to do because the elders, the indigenous elders that I work with, say that uh, they want to get their messages out to the world now because human beings, it's not a question about whether or not Mother Earth is going to survive. She survived for billions of years. She's going to survive for billions more. Uh, it's a question about whether or not human beings are going to survive and this generation of people alive in the world now is going to decide whether or not we're going to survive. And that gives us very little time. I want to reflect that back because it's so important because what I just heard you say is that the elders, and I want to just remind our audience in part that, um, you know, part of your function, your role in the world, you have been and are in contact with indigenous elders from all lineages. And you have been, you've had the responsibility and the honor of convening them in multiple gatherings. And so when you're speaking, you're speaking of um, lineages around the world where the elders are saying, this generation now will decide how things move from here forward. And I heard you say the earth, she's been here for billions of years, she will continue. The question is whether or not humanity continues. And for humanity to continue, it cannot be business as usual. This, uh, you know, this coronavirus that everyone is under now, uh, that is something unleashed by Mother Earth uh, to the world. And uh, because Mother Earth has intelligence and has consciousness, and, and she uh, has has suffered a lot under the hands of this imbalanced uh, systems around the world. And, uh, and so she's letting this, this virus out to let us stop, slow down, mm. and contemplate what it is that we want to see in the world. Unless we do that, we're going to, you know, the, the coronavirus is going to get a second wind and it's going to kick off much more violently than it has in the past. Uh, and, uh, or we're going to have other kinds of things very similar to this happen to the world. And so it's, it's uh, the most gentlest way that Mother Earth can deal with it now with us. Uh, to try to get us to slow down. And you, you see from around the world when we were sequestered in, in our homes that uh, the ozone layers start to heal, that uh, they can see uh, from, uh, the Himalayan mountains from India for the first time in 30 years, 
that animals were going out in every single place in the world, going where humans used to be, that weren't anymore. Uh, and this was to sh her showing us that Mother Earth herself, she can rejuvenate the world in a very short time. And if we just allow that and we remember what our niche is, and the only way to remember is to, to go to one's heart. And each person alive today is here for a purpose. And that uh, uh, it, in order to know what that purpose is, you have to go to your heart. Uh, because it'll tell you. It never lies. It, it never has fear. It always loves and it has compassion. And it will tell you what your unique gift is for this time. Uh, and that this gift will be to the world. And every single person, I mean, there's no more gurus. Uh, I mean, all of us are gurus now. We were brought here for this purpose. And uh, if we can take on that responsibility to understand what it means, then we'll be able to get to the place of being uh, in our niche. My people, for example, they never had footwear even in the winter time in Alaska. Wow. And we developed, and we're the only native person people in Alaska that did that. And we were the uh, we developed the most densely populated linear mile of shoreline in North America, all of North America. Uh, and um, in a place that's hard to eke out a living. So how or why? And I asked my elder on St. Paul, and he says, well, look, even the birds don't worry about what they're going to, how they're going to feed themselves the next day. Are we any different? And that's the basis of uh, Unungan culture and how we survived and thrived for over 10,000 years in Bering Sea. We trust, we trust implicitly. I mean, the Bible, for those who follow the Christian path, uh, you know, Jesus' teachings about uh, this and, and more you shall do. But the only way to do that is to um, um, trust implicitly in your life, in yourself, in uh, your relationships, in your community, in the world. Uh, trust Mother Earth. Trust the universe, trust the whole we call a whole, which is the maker. Uh, we trust implicitly without thought, embodied in, at a cellular level in our bodies. And that's the only way that we're going to do it. I, I was with Don Alejandro one time. He was the keeper of the day calendar for the Mayans. And we spent a week together before he died. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, the people who are going to negotiate this time uh, the, the, the best are going to be people of the fire, which is people of the heart. And that those who, who ignore these things, Mother Earth is going through an increase in her consciousness. And she's trying to help us increase our consciousness too. But those who do not, are not going to fare very well. I am being told that some of the people who hear your words will be able to fully receive them. They will be able to enter fully and that will be transformational for them in hearing your words. They will feel in their hearts and understand what you're saying. And I wonder for those who are feeling the yearning of what you're speaking of, but maybe aren't sure how to practice or aren't familiar with how to tune into their hearts. One of the things we've talked about before is that often in the West, uh, here in the United States, the mindfulness movement, people think of that as being still sitting on a cushion. And one of the things I heard you say the first time that we were together was that that might not be so good for people here who are already pretty dissociated, that mindfulness might need to be more active. And we've talked about, you know, um, being in nature and tracking or, you know, following a sign or hunting some some way the, the attention gets trained that's more active. And I wondered if you had thoughts about how people might practice this tuning into the heart um, through awareness, but maybe not in such a still kind of way that's prone to be dissociative. 
Yeah, well, like you said, the, the Western society has adopted a lot of the Eastern ways, and for some people it is good, for some people it's not, because Americans, for example, are very active, and, they, they, and it takes a lot for them to sit there and say, I'm not going to think, I'm not <laughs> going to think. <laughs> <laughs> and what they do is they think. <laughs> uh, and so it's very difficult for them to do that. Yeah. Um, with what, uh, what the Hopi and Maori say is that we must let go of the sides of the riverbank, move to the center, find those who have done the same, and celebrate. What that means, letting go of the sides of the riverbank, means letting go of all of your human attachments. You might be, you know, attached to planning your future. You might be attached to, you know, because you're worried about how you're going to survive. You know, you're attached to your loved ones. We're, we're, we have all kinds of attachments. And so to let go is take itself is a great act of courage. To let that all go. Uh, go to your center means go to your heart center and the center of the river of life, because it knows where it's going, we don't. Find those who have done the same means, uh, find those who have had the courage to jump like you did, and those is, that's uh, what they say is it's, it's a definition of the new tribal member, that the old definition of tribe is going to disappear, that uh, you will find your person of like mind and heart, or like-minded heart. Mm. Um, and so that's that's one thing. The other thing is, the elders are saying, you know, the model for our cultures, all of our cultures, um, uh, is a two-year-old child. Mm. And when you see a two-year-old child, they are just natural, and they have an inherent intelligence already that gets buried when we become adults. And when when a child is you know gets angry at their buddies and they just engage their whole bodies you know they're just like mad as hell, and so and then two minutes later it's all gone, and they're playing with their buddy again. Right. That's the that's the real human being, wow. and that uh, there are a myriad of ways. There's no formula for for doing this. There are a myriad of ways for. There probably are more. Uh, just as many ways as there are human beings. We have to find our way. And uh, some people like to go out into nature, but, but be mindful of it because are you going out to nature to recreate? Are you going out to nature to take something? Because we are in a world of give me, give me, give me. This is about me. When it's, a, it's about everything. You know, Native people... Uh, see everything is connected and they're interdependent and so when you're out in nature just be don't try to do this or that don't try to recreate we were i mean we're, we're recreating our natural areas so badly that we're destroying it yeah. we're destroying that which we love uh or we we go out for you know uh what do you call mountain climbing and river rafting and all that? Uh, but the main thing is to, that native people do. You see, very few native people do those kind of things, climb mountains and all that, just because it's there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, um, what we do is commune with nature. But in order to do that, you've got to unclutter your mind. Wow. It's very beautiful what you're speaking to. I was uh, I was remembering something that happened. I, you know, I talked a little bit about the, this uh, the, the first TP ceremony that I went to, and sort of just thinking about what it means to allow your heart to drive versus being in cognition. And I remember, you know, these things that happened that we thought were mysterious at the time, but when I look back, it was simply we were being sort of coached to let go of what we thought was going to happen. And I think part of what's so scary to a lot of you know, modern people is that there's an illusion of control when we're in our thoughts. And releasing that sense of control and allowing, you know, it's like uh, in order to dance, we can't be thinking about what we're going to do next, right? If you're thinking about it, you can't dance, right? 
And That's so right. there's a way that we have to allow ourselves to find the moment and the direction and the pull that it has. And I think if we're looking for peoples who've been able to do that, we turn our attention to indigenous and traditional cultures because as you're saying, they're based in that, that, that resting in the present moment, that trust that yep. the present moment will die. Yep, and uh, you know, the reason I'm doing this is, well, there are several messengers throughout the world that are doing similar thing, is, is that um, they ask us to be messengers. Uh, and uh, to carry, to spread the word out. And uh, before, even five years ago, I couldn't talk about these kinds of things that we're talking about today. And, and uh, we're being helped. And so a lot of information and knowledge and wisdom is being trans, is ready for, it's, the, the world is ripe for this. And uh, I've been traveling, I mean, the last two years, I've traveled all over the world because we're invited now, finally. Uh, and, um, but the thing is, people might say, well, yeah, you know, I know it's indigenous stuff and it's very wise. And, but then they stop there. And the elders don't care about whether or not they achieve fame or notoriety or something. They're, they're people without ego. Yeah. They are genuinely trying to help. And um, if, you know, it, it's not a matter of whether or not they're recognized. It's a matter of whether or not to them, people are getting the message that we have to go to the heart and we've got to do it now. And business as usual is not going to work. Part of what I hear you saying is that we have to change our behavior now. And not only our behavior, but but our very being, because I mean, you talk about just food alone, for example, in the Western you uh, Western countries, we're eating polluted food. And some food is actually changing us genetically. Yeah. Uh, and our, our DNA. It's like uh, we we're not conscious of what we're doing, and food is just one element of this thing. So there's a there's a lot that will, will change when you change to your heart, and that includes the kind of food we eat, uh, and includes everything. How we go out into nature, and, and you know, you just name it, and those things will change, and we all want that. We say, sure, let's do that. But then where's the follow-up? Where's the follow-through? I want to speak as a white person here in, in ownership of whiteness and also to those who are watching who are people who are white because I think part of what we've brought is a tremendous arrogance. You know, and um, I think it's becoming more and more clear, more and more obvious for example, the area where we are in Northern California, we've had devastating wildfires for the last several seasons. They continue to increase in intensity. Part of the reason for that is because the, the traditional peoples who lived here for thousands of years actively tended the forests in a very specific way. And they would burn dead wood. There was not an accumulation of fuel loads. When the forestry practices changed to, you know, white scientific in quotes forestry practices, they said, oh, nature, you don't touch that, leave it alone. And as a result, the fuel loads from dead wood accumulated. And now when a forest fire comes through, there's so much dead wood that it becomes an inferno. The indigenous people ancestrally knew to prevent that by working with the living world to tend it, right? So there's a very profound way that we have to, I think as white people really understand that the, the experts in this area and I don't even like using the word expert because it sounds like an elevation, but within wow. humility, the teachers, the people who actually know about this stuff are not people trained in a Western scientific method. They are the indigenous peoples who've been tending these ecologies with great skill for many thousands of years. That's right. You know, I was at a uh, gathering in, in California, actually, where a bunch of shakers and movers of the world gathered and I was asked to uh, be there and to participate. 
and uh, they came up with this plan. This was last year, by the way. They came up with this plan to plant six trillion trees in South America as a solution to you know what's happening down there. And they didn't think they they weren't conscious. They weren't discerning enough to go beyond that until we presented what we had. Uh, I was with uh, a Hawaiian elder, uh, Kumu Sebra, um, or Andy uh, uh, Puna, uh, and we steered the meeting to be run by women. In, uh, before it was just all, all the men that were proposing this. Then when the women got together, they deliberated and then they decided no we should not uh, just plant trees we should partner with the local people who understand the, these ways who have had sustained contact with their immediate environment and figure out what's best to do in their particular area uh, and it's it's a myth that native people uh, never touch nature right, right. Uh, i mean it's it's a total myth uh, Native peoples have always been involved with nature, but they don't just think about it. It's, 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 I don't know how to explain this to the Western world, but it's, it's like you receive the information. Uh, what my people, we, we say there's a womb at the center of the universe, and that womb is a, port, is a place of creation and creativity. And that uh, the, the, the same sacred space uh, energy wise is in the female body uh, in the womb and this is why women all over the world were considered sacred at one time but that has been forgotten uh, and uh, LGBT uh, uh, community uh, they're suffering from violent abuse for thousands of years and so, and, but they used to be looked at as, as uh, spiritually advanced hmm. to us because they already uh, embody the two opposites, uh, that male and female. Wow. And th this is something that we human beings are trying to achieve now. And the elders are saying that um, it's like a pendulum is swinging back and forth since the beginning of time. And now, this time, at this time, we have the opportunity to bring this pendulum swing to dead center. It used to swing from masculine imbalance to feminine imbalance, and now it has a chance of being in dead center, or alive center, where I would say. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, so, you know, there, there's so much uh, that Native peoples can offer the world. And if, 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 if we would just be listened to and heard. Um, now, most people would say, okay, I'm going to hear what that person says and think about it. Mm. And that immediately gets it off center. Right. Uh, yeah. If you come from your heart, you, you just receive it. You don't judge it. Uh, you don't do anything uh, but listen. And then your heart will tell you whether or not what that person is saying uh, is true or something that you resonate with because you remember now. Uh, now, everything that I'm saying, if anybody resonates with it, it's because I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just reminding you of what you already know. I like to, in compliments your words, remind those of us who identify as white or as European American that um, there are also indigenous European Americans and that part of the devastation in the modern world is that tracks back to the Inquisition when those earth-based peoples of Europe were systematically destroyed and that there's a imbalance that came from that destruction. And so, just an invitation and a reminder to those of us who are white that the indigeneity of what you're speaking is a, is a potentially universal inheritance. And also that as people, you know, I'm speaking as someone in the United States, 
Um, it's really important for us to know the history here, not the mythology of this country, but the history, and to understand the perpetration enacted by people who are white upon indigenous people. And I, th this is a, a big conversation. I don't know if we want to open this up now, but I do think it's very significant for us who are in the United States, part of a colonial enterprise, to um, really be aware of who we are in relation to the indigenous communities here and how incredibly gracious, you know, all of them are to give us the, the, the kindness of their regard to be sharing wisdom after the things that we have done. It's an astounding display of grace. Yes, it is. You know, when I was a child, uh, one of the unique things about my people is that uh, you, the, the world doesn't know that we were slaves, first of the Russians and then of the U.S. government. We achieved our political independence in 1966, and, and uh, we couldn't vote. We couldn't leave the island. We had food, clothing, housing rationed to us. Uh, and uh, they were used to punitively p punish someone if if uh, we violated the government agent's rules. Uh, and uh, so it, I was born a slave. Wow. Now, my people were also decimated, where 80% of our population was wiped out in 50 years by the Russians. And so we had our Holocaust, like the Jews. And like the Japanese Americans, we were interned in Southeast Alaska by the U.S. government. And uh, we lost, the un, but different, uh, our experience was different than the Japanese Americans because 10% of our population died in two years due to malnutrition and disease uh, at the hands of the U.S. government. And, and then, you know, we... Uh, so like the black African Americans, we were enslaved and like the Japanese Americans, we were interned and like the Jews, we had our Holocaust, but yet the elders never showed or indicated or said anything bad about anyone, even when I was growing up. And uh, this is the legacy that I carry thanks to my elders. This is why I work with the world now. Because they said, if you have bitterness or hatred, you you don't do you don't hurt that person that you're bitter or hatred about. You hurt yourself, and by hurting yourself, you hurt your people. And uh, and this is uh, a beautiful way, and this is how indigenous people do respond, because we understand that there is something very very different about negative or, or dark uh, energies like the, that we take on, like, like this one. Now, for your white audience, as well as anyone else who would listen to this, I was up in, uh, uh, in, uh, up in Alberta. I was invited to the Morley Reserve where elders were conducting a sacred ceremony they hadn't performed in 150 years, even in secret. And they, they invited me to come. Uh, I didn't know how they knew I was there. But I was there visiting some friends, but they, they received a phone call. And so I'm invited to go there. And it was in a battered women's shelter. And all of the elders had white, literally white hair, all white hair. Uh, there were about 15 of them. They're all white hair. And they all wore nothing but their regalia. And they spoke only their language. And the ceremony that I was watching lasted for four hours. In the middle of it, so the, one of the elders stood up and said, we're speaking English for the benefit of our friend from Alaska. Hmm. We know why you're here. And of course, I thought I was there because they invited me, but they knew something else. And so they said, oh, uh, as you know, we've been praying to the creator. They had four sacred pipes in four directions. And the thing is, the, the smoke of these pipes didn't go up. They went sideways to weave together with all the other pipes. Then it went up. And I knew that I was with real elders. And they said, we've been praying to the creator and we have a message for you to carry. And that is that we know that there are many people who think they've lost their spiritual ways, 
but it's not true that it has been kept for you in the unseen world waiting for you to wake up in spirit and that was the end of it and then they continued on with their ceremony for another two hours so when i took that to heart uh, you know i i listened to it and i applied it to myself and it's very very true from my experience that when you genuinely drop from your mind to your heart all of this is opened up again so you will know what you need to do uh, it's not going to be a western system plan that you're going to have it's going to be for for some person it might be i'm going to just dance or i'm going to you know make something beautiful uh, with mother earth I'm going to cooperate with Mother Earth. Any of these things would, would not make sense to the Western way because you're not worried about money uh, and you're not worried about what, what other people are going to think because most people will think you're crazy. But that's why we find those who have done the same and celebrate because they know this experience. I'm so deeply touched by your words. Um, it's a very beautiful conversation. I'm very grateful to be speaking with you. Um, finding our passions, finding what brings us alive, brings us joy. Exactly. Um, I wonder if we could speak for a moment about Ang Wan, the way that you introduced when you when I greeted you and you, you because the Unangan word for what we would say you in English is my other self. Is that right? The translation of it, Angwan? Yep, that literally means hello, my other self. I wanna I wanna just bring attention to this for a minute because there's no such word in English. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we think about a lot in terms of language. So we've been working on a linguistics project for many years um, because there are similar words in a variety of cultures. There's a beautiful word in uh, Nguni Bantu, uh, Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. There's a word in Filipino, Kapwa, which means it's translated as neighbor, but it really means recognizing the other as myself. And then this beautiful word in, in your language. Um, and I think it speaks to this profound awareness of a, of a common humanity and that we're interdependent. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about interbeing, right? This, this fabric of interbeing. And I wondered if you could say something about that. Well, this again is very difficult to explain to people uh, who are in the head. But uh, it's, I know, I, I don't speak about anything that I don't know personally. I have to experience it personally in order to talk about what I talk about. And it's only true for me. I don't know if it's true for anybody else. It's, everybody's different. Uh, but what I know is that uh, when I communicate and commune with Mother Earth, for example, or anything else in existence, that, uh, that I am the same as they are i am the same as any animal i am the same because you know fish for example they have a collective consciousness that we don't recognize in western society um, and for here it's salmon um, and so i i see that force that life force in them and in everything in creation we say you know, you, the people in, in Western religion, they say God is in everything, right? And so what it means is literal, that God exists within us, in us. Each breath we take is a breath that comes from God. And that everyone else is the same. So that ultimately, I think that you're different <laughs> and because you're different personality and different acting in a different way. And so I treat you as different. Uh, but in reality, 
I am talking to myself by talking with you. That, uh, that this is uh, only uh, illusion that we are all separate and different. We are not separate. We are all the same. But how to explain that, uh, you, you, ha you can't explain it because you have to experience it. Yeah. And when we extend that circle truly to all humanity, all living things, then there are no others. That's right. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, I, I really deeply feel, and I again, I'm speaking very much from my own experience here, that the root of, I think probably the root of the modern and the root of this, you know, suffering is this illusion of separation. And, but it's a, it's a felt experience of separation, and we have to penetrate that experience. You know, and I know, and I don't really generally speak about this, but for me that happened... Um, in 2012, um, very, very near the end of the Mayan calendar, when my mind literally finally came apart and I, um, I was actually in psychiatric hospitalization for a period of time. And the only reason I survived um, was because my, my wife and my father and my dear friend Mitchell refused to let go of me. They just refused, you know? And uh, I, I literally, at that point, I couldn't control my mind, my thoughts at all. Um, I was convinced I would not survive, but they wouldn't let me go. And I, within all of the chaos of that, came to understand that we aren't separate at the deepest level of the fabric of which this is woven, we're connected. And I think yeah. I, I could see that I had, I don't know if it was from my experience as a child of trauma, whatever it was, I had, I had closed down really tightly to defend, you know, to, to, because I was so deeply hurt and yeah. uh, that, that, that was finally shattered, you know, and I got to rebuild my mind very slowly after that and come back to balance from a different place, you know? Yeah. Yep. But, and oftentimes uh, that happens for people who have uh, an important mission to follow. Um, and for me, it, I had a similar kind of experience, but I was six years old and I had double pneumonia and I almost died. And, you know, no one in the community was allowed to see me. I wasn't allowed to be because the government agent was afraid that my people would steal from them, which would, that would never happen. But anyway, I couldn't even see my family when I was there in my deathbed. And I would go escape to this silent this place of deep, deep peace and silence uh, to, es to escape from this body. And I would come back and I'd wake up in my own urine and excrement and I'd say, no, I'm not going to be here. And I'd go back. Um, and uh, that's when I found out that even the spiritual can be an escape. <laughs> uh, and, and so... Uh, this this thing of, uh, the, of the experiences, what we have, helps us to be who we are now, and I'm sure you know that now, uh, that we give thanks to those who have helped us through this. And no one is really alone. If you need help, there are people there who would, would support you and be there for you. And, you know, that's all you need. Like one time I was down, uh, walked on St. Paul Island down to a dance. And uh, I saw a group of men that were surrounding a guy who was holding up a, a knife, a big, big knife. Wow. And they were trying to stop him from killing himself. And I knew immediately what to do. I said, okay, all you men leave now. And they left. And it was just me and him. And I, I knew what he was going through because, hello, my other self, Ang Wan. And so I walked towards him until the knife was right at my chest. And I said, I know you don't want to do this. I know you don't want to do this. I'm here for you. I love you. And he just dropped his knife and fell to the ground and curved curled up into a ball and I just hugged him and from 
from that moment on, he became one of the most uh, invaluable members of our community because it just takes a human being to show that they love and they care about the other. That's all it takes. And that energy will take form that you don't even imagine. And I never imagined this guy who was a drunk every day of his life stopped drinking and he dedicated his life to helping others, including helping a friend, his best friend, who was paralyzed from the hips down and he couldn't even defecate. And he had to reach inside of this guy to take the stuff out every day. Wow. And he said, you know, he came to me, he was crying. He said, you know, this hurts. This really hurts because I know I'm hurting him when this happens, but he's got to do it in order to live. And uh, this is just one example of a guy who um, thought he was lost. Mm. And it takes one communication of love with a human being in order to help each other. Koyaks, it's an honor to speak with you. I'm so happy to be in conversation with you. And I hope that those who are um, watching this, listening to it, can feel the love in everything you're saying. Nothing happened by accident. So <laughs> I'm glad that we met my other self. Likewise. And, and it's, it's no accident that other people are hearing this. So. Yeah. Uh, but I detach from that, that it's none of my business what people do. I can offer what I have, but it's up to them to decide whether or not they pick it up. Whether or not they do is none of my business. <laughs> um, beautiful. Well, I think, uh, you know, we can sort of conclude the formal portion of this. And uh, we'll just wish everyone at the Global Resilience Summit well. And... Um, I'll just say to you, it's a pleasure and it's, it feels like a homecoming to be in conversation. So thank you. Thank you.